That number means something very special to a lot of people. I'd like to tell you about my favorite pair of jeans. It's a century-old style that fits seamlessly in today's modern fashion. But it's also the story of how Levi's took their double X waist overalls and made them even better. This is the first 501. This is the 1890 episode. Now on Ten and Denim. There's so much we could talk about for the history of Levi's in San Francisco during the 1890s. This is the decade that saw Mr. Strauss retire, and he allowed his nephews, the Stern brothers, to run the company. We could talk about Mr. Strauss's charitable support for the University of California at Berkeley. We should mention the anti-Chinese discrimination that swept through the U.S., San Francisco, and even the hiring process at LS & Co. I address the Chinese Exclusion Act in this episode, Levi's Ugly History, so that I can focus on the historical changes to this pair of jeans. What's so special about the year 1890 for Levi's? Well, it was when the patent expired. After six months of trying, Levi's was finally granted a patent for riveted pants on May 20th, 1873. The patent was renewed on March 16th, 1875. However, there was no extension past that initial 17 years. And beginning in 1890, any company could make pants with rivets and there wasn't a thing Levi's could do about it. Legally. Part of the genius behind who Mr. Strauss was has to do with his foresight to the importance of branding. He knew that making good quality items was one factor for success. But he was decades ahead of his contemporaries in his consistent use of identifying features that would resonate in the minds of potential consumers. There's a reason Levi's is the proprietary eponome for a generic pair of jeans. Besides being the first, the name has seeped into our social consciousness. And that has to do with trademarks. Pre-1890, we see how Levi's was crafting their jeans with four details that stated what they were. The first was the company name, Levi Strauss & Co. SF Cal. He put the address on there in case you wanted to write him a letter. We love the letters on this channel and in Levi's history. You can see the company name engraved on the buttons and the leather patch. Also on the patch was the patent date, May 20, 1873. This date was important to them back then and is celebrated each year today with 501 Day. For the first 17 years, the patent date was punched into each rivet. The next detail was not visible on the jeans themselves, but was part of the name of the garment. Levi sold duck pants and waist overalls. If you got the waist overalls, you could select from the quality of denim they offered. Only the ones made from Amiskag 9 ounce denim could be called double X. Mr. Strauss proudly came up with the title because to him, the double X meant extra strong. The arcuate stitching. This one began in 1874 or something. We know it wasn't there in 1873, but was soon afterwards. There's also the mystery of who came up with the idea, what it means. I've got the 1875 oldest, oldest, precious Grimes episode for that whole discussion. By 1890, Competing clothes manufacturers could now sell riveted garments. Levi's needed to distinguish their products from the competitors. For the 1890s, Mr. Strauss and his company came up with three distinct advertising methods that are still used to this day. To understand the American experience, you need some concept of trademarks and logos. The basic principle is the creative masters will continue doing their best so long as they are protected financially from imitators. In practice, it creates an expected experience for consumers. The victory of America in the 20th century has to do with selling an image to the world. And Levi's has truly done its part. And Levi's has done its part in selling that image to the world. Let's begin with the one I most commonly get asked. The one that is of course the most famous. Why 501? What does 501 mean? Here in the 21st century, we live in a gig economy. We rate each other and get rated based on a five star system. Five stars means it's the best 
and anything less loses you money. Well, some concept of that existed in the 19th century as well. Mr. Strauss knew that five meant the highest quality and his customers would understand that. Each garment Levi's made was given a lot number. There was the series number and then two more digits. 200 for the lesser quality denim, 400 series for engineer and mechanic clothing, 500 for the double X Amaskag denim. The next two digits were assigned for each item. 501 for waist overalls, 01 for waist overalls, 04 for the jumpers, and 06 for the blouses. Since the waist overalls were the primary item, they were given 01 to the 201 and 501 jeans. English likes to use few names for zero, but especially American English likes to use the O. Thus, 501. In the 20th century, Levi's continued with the 100 series with 300 for the cheapest denim, 600 for orange tab items, and 700 for women. Then the whole system got a little crazy and it doesn't mean as much now, but it still has some logic. In the 1960s, the middle digit was assigned zero for shrink to fit and five for pre-shrunk. Thus the 551s, 559 were pre-shrunk. If you put the numbers 501, then you get the highest quality denim, shrink to fit, waist overalls. But the number itself has become something much more. It is a consistent sign for the most timeless pair of jeans. It separates Levi's main item from the rest. As the other lines came into play, the 501 became a symbol for the men and women who wanted classic shrink-to-fit denim they could break in as their own. Now, it has both a popularized meaning for classic jeans and a group of hardcore fans who will settle for nothing less. Heck, I named my firstborn after this number. If you buy a new pair of Levi's jeans, perhaps one of the rigid 501 models, then you will find a very special rectangular piece of paper lightly stitched into the leg. This is the guarantee ticket. And it's been there since 1892. Now, of course there have been some changes, but for the most part, it still exists. Most of the text and imagery has remained the same. The upper left corner is reserved for the grand silver medal awarded by Mechanics Institute Silver medal awarded by Cal State Fair. The right side bears the two horse logo and Mr. Strauss's signature at the bottom right. The language of the text is updated about every decade or so. There are some big changes I'd like to note. The for X amount of years at the top has updated along the way. They started the dating at 20 years in 1892 implying the beginning was 1873. This was consistent until about the 1940s when it started to jump years, and in 1955 they were saying for over 100 years. Eventually, by the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, and are realigning it back to about 1873. In 1927, the This is a pair of them changed to This is a pair of Levi's stating that Levi's was now the official brand name. Below that line was originally the writing, they are positively superior. And this remained until the 1960s when the term jeans became more commonplace. Thus, the more modernized, they are the original blue jeans. They are made of nine ounce Amaskag denim was changed by 1920 to American denim. Then 10 ounce in the 1930s, and then again in the 1940s to read exclusive double X special top weight all cotton denim. And sewed with the strongest linen thread remains minus the word linen, which has been excluded since 1915. At the very bottom, the instructions, by cutting the thread, this ticket can be removed, implying the guarantee ticket was affixed by thread. By the 1930s, that was replaced by a staple. The language by pulling the staple has remained the same despite all guarantee tickets being affixed by threads again. Every pair guaranteed also changed in the 1960s to read, guaranteed a new pair free if they rip, 
then to change again to every pair satisfaction guaranteed by the 1980s. Satisfaction seems harder to achieve than ripping, but that's the modernized language. During the 1950s, there was a contest. How many stitches in your britches? On the back of the guarantee ticket was a form to fill out and send with your guess. Sometimes it is referred to as the mission dollar bill. As it states the corporate mission, and there's also the local San Francisco connection to the mission district. California having been settled by the missions. Besides the customers, Levi's sales associates would carry with them a stack of guarantee tickets with a sample swath of double X denim held to the guarantee ticket by a rivet. This way, store owners could read and feel about the denim and rivets offered by Levi's. The guarantee tickets were originally printed on a linen fabric, similar to the oil cloth patch. You can even see from the back of them. At some point in the 1940s, 50s, they started to change them to a coarse paper. And by the 1980s, they've just been that thin cardboard that they've been since. If you buy a recreated pair of LVC, then you should still get one of these old linen style guarantee tickets. If you buy a new pair of 1890 rigid 501s, then you won't get a guarantee tag. You gotta buy 1901 or after to get that because it starts in 1892. Why include it in this episode then? Well, I've got other plans for the 1901 episode and I knew the 1890 would get more views and I really love the guarantee ticket. I just think it's this awesome souvenir aspect of Levi's that I've really cherished since my youth and I look forward to in each pair. This is perhaps the first souvenir element from Levi's. As a teenager, I would get a new pair and rip off the flasher, but carefully remove the threads of the guarantee ticket. Then place it in my desk drawer The Two Horse brand. We all know this one. The Two Horse patch is something you can find on pretty much every Levi's item. Aside from the red tab, this is the most iconic symbol for Levi's. The two horses pulling a pair of jeans in opposite directions. The message is clear. These jeans are strong. They can't be ripped. This is the visual equivalent of the guarantee ticket. You don't need to be a literate man to understand Levi's are the best. While Levi Strauss and Company was the name of the corporation, the Two Horse brand was the official brand name until 1928. For 40 years, customers just asked for the pants with two horses on it. I point out in the series when the text of the patch changes, but here's a quick recap. Patent in USA changes to patented in the 1920s, but in USA comes back later in the 60s. Copper riveted changes to original riveted in 1940s war years. The leather patch is replaced by a paper patch in 1955. Every garment guaranteed is removed in 1963. In 1966, the double X was removed from the lot numbers. 1970 was the first year to have the tear off tab. Despite the changes, the two horse logo has remained. The image can be seen on many Levi's items and has become a worldwide recognized symbol. But is it practical? Well, this scene has been reenacted a few times. First in 1942, a store owner in Hawaii purchased a pair and put it to the test. They used mules, which are stronger than horses. After a big tussle, the pants finally ripped. Sadly, one of the mules died from exhaustion. Levi's refunded the sale. However, the guy returned Levi's check to them because it wasn't a fair fight. I'll read the letter in the letter section about this. The next was in Henderson, Nevada in 1989. There's no record of the outcome, but there is a photograph of the setup. And I love the enthusiasm. Artist Simon Milan did his own two-horse reenactment in 2010. You can watch his video of it on YouTube under the title Levi's Logo. Link in description. 
Now the horses didn't seem to want to cooperate, but maybe it was more for the setup than to conduct the strength test. Now this points out the engineering problem here. If you really wanted to tug with the most direct force, then it would be with one horse and a pole. It's just not as dramatic. Now if you could imagine this is the logo, you see it's just not as dramatic as the two horses. In 2022, a group from Latvia, in honor of Jacob Davis' birthplace, reattempted the two horse challenge. The Levi's ripped quicker than a pair of Lee jeans. All of these tests were done on pairs contemporary to the times. And it's a sign that Levi's basic 501s have decreased in quality. I'd like to see them put Selvage to the test. The tow rope story is the one surviving example of when a pair of Levi's saved the day by towing a stranded vehicle. More on that in the 1933 episode. While Levi Strauss and Company was the name for the corporation, the two horse brand was the official brand name until 1928. For 40 years, customers just asked for the pants with two horses on it. It's worked our way into our iconography. I don't always expect the advertising message to live up to its meaning. I can accept an air of exaggeration. It's part of the language to speak about horsepower. And the imagery conjures up thoughts of the Old West. The fit is true to size. I'm a 31, I got 32, tub soaked them, they fit perfectly. However, I would recommend having them just a bit loose because you might want to use the cinch and suspenders. I wear them only a third of the way up the waist to the navel. I have a perfect cup after tub soaking. Best jeans ever. One weird issue that I don't mind but I want to warn you about is the fabric exposed in the front pockets. If you get your right fit or smaller, then you will have a sliver of the white pocket bag sandwiched between the denim. I see this in the 1901 as well. I kind of like it, gives it a nice little pop-up look. I think hemmed or cuffed, they look great. I'm wearing them with Levi's Iron Rangers, but they look great with sneakers too. I know LVC talks about these as being anti-fit. Anti-fit is supposed to be very loose and baggy, but if you get your waist size and you tub soak, then they should fit you snugly. I feel like the fit on the 1890 and the 1966 are very close. Classic straight leg, just the perfect cup, wear just above the waist, wonderful fit. This is an historic pair of jeans. There are a lot of differences if you compare them to, say, a modern pair. But there are a few things that stay the same up through today. The 1890 jeans were the first to feature the two-horse logo on the patch. The patch has undergone changes, but the two-horse logo and lot number 501 are still there. The placement in the center would get lost once the cinch was used. Mr. Strauss wanted his name and two-horse logo seen by all. We can argue about the placement of the patch prior to 1890, but we are certain it took its place on the right leg this year and stayed there. The watch pocket placement is also moved to its contemporary position, slightly lowered. The 1890s were also the first to feature shank buttons. Previous double X waist overall years would have had sewn on buttons on the fly and suspenders. It requires a machine to affix the shank buttons, whereas sewn on buttons could be done by hand. In all of the historical 19th century pairs that I look at, I see solid shank buttons or sewn on buttons. I don't see the donut buttons LVC is using in 2023. It's a stylistic choice. If you like the donut buttons with the thread in the center, then you can get them on the 2023 White Oak Limited Edition, 1890s and 1901 501s. Plus the 1890 Twin Peaks, the 1880 Chinos, and in the 201 jeans from prior years, don't forget that 1944 also had unbranded donut buttons. The shank buttons of the 1890s still have a little dip in them. It wouldn't be until the 1930s that they became smooth. Plain white selvage denim, 
Most pairs are historically accurate 9 ounce weight, but some distress models are 13 and a half ounce. The 19 ounce weight increases to 12 ounce once you shrink them. One rear pocket. Miners didn't like rear pockets. Discussion to be continued in the 1901 episode. Single needle arcuate stitching, along with exposed rivets on said rear pocket. The crotch rivet, because it's a point of strain. The best cinch. This is a strong wrought iron cinch that you can clip and fold again and again. I've only seen this type of cinch in the 1890 year. The slide cinches work and you don't damage the fabric or metal, but they aren't very historically accurate. The rest of the cinches are this delicate material that barely pokes through the denim, let alone sturdily holds it in place. 1890's got the good cinch. Pocket bag stamp. It's kind of fun to get the two horse stamp on the pocket bag, mostly because of the hilarious slogan, for 17 years. That's one of those details that transports you back in time. Some have very clear text and others are faded. Obviously, they didn't include the racist white labor comments in any of those recreations. The Fuzzly Wuzzlies. Some pairs have this and some don't. Some pairs have a little medium blend of it. Now, the inside seams are soft, frayed denim. But this is a real treat if you own a historical era pair or reproduction. It looks barbaric to a 20th century person, but now it's pretty cool and shows off the handmade aspect. If you buy a rigid pair, it's the best way. However, you won't get the flasher because that doesn't start till 1937. You also won't get the guarantee ticket because that doesn't start until 1892. There are four kinds of rigid from the 1890s. Triple O9, rigid natural indigo dye with dulled rivets. That's the one I have. Double O15, rigid medium dye with dulled rivets. There's the 0019, rigid dark with shiny copper rivets. The newest ones, White Oak Limited Editions for 2023, look like the natural medium indigo dye with dulled rivets, similar to the 0009, but they come with donut buttons. Now for the distress models. Remember, these will not shrink. You need unwashed rigid for that. Some of them are vault pieces, which mean the whiskers and rips are replicated from historical garments. Backstop, from home run, Spring Summer 2016. Some more sewn on patchwork, scuffing, medium blue. Bandit. Bandit is a pair that shows what it would look like if you needed to make your jeans longer. You can see the patchwork extends at the ankles to go down. Buried Wrath. Some stains the front knees and honeycomb in the back. This is the darkest blue in the distressed versions. Twin Peaks from 2023 with donut buttons. This is the lightest blue of the bunch. The next ones are the archival pieces. This means they are replicas of similar distression marks and patchings to historical pairs discovered and kept in the Levi's archives. Death Valley. This is a limited edition based on an archival piece found at a borax mine in Death Valley, California. The white fading is caused by calcium and borax. Signature cinch back. This limited edition piece has exuberant whiskers in the rear legs and peeling in the front. It comes with a laundry sack. Spur Bites. This is another archival piece, dated to 1891 to 1900. Well patched up with honeycombs. It came with a denim bag. They are made of 13 and a half ounce denim rather than the nine ounce. I have a couple special letters for this episode. This one, written in 1891 by Mr. Strauss, 
to a friend who made wines in California. Mrs. Poppy, dear madam, the case of Poppy's best came duty to hand and two bottles were sampled at our table. Although I am no wine expert, my judgment is that California need not feel ashamed of what you are producing. Permit me to thank you for your kind remembrance, and at the same time, receive from me as a souvenir of the new year a dress which I have forwarded to you by express. Very truly, Levi Strauss. Happy New Year to all! When Mr. Strauss wrote this letter, California wine was only in its infancy, and it would take another 80 years until it would be recognized as world class. This next bonus letter is written by the Hawaiian store owner who tested out the two-horse method with a mule. Levi's refunded his money, but then he returned the check to Levi's because it wasn't a fair fight. Dear Mr. Cronin, we are returning your check. It hurts the writer's scotch blood to do it, but the test was hardly fair. Mules are stronger than horses, and even at that, the Levi's came near winning. At the end of the tussle, one of the mules dropped from exhaustion and expired a short time later. Yours very truly, Paia Store, John Moody, Manager. To the owner of this 501 gene. Why Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis invented the blue gene in 1873? 1890 was the first year the 501 lot number was adopted. Levi Strauss and Company's patent for riveted clothing expired that same year, meaning that other companies could now also use rivets on clothing. To answer the coming competition, LS & Co. printed the inside pocket bag with information about the strength and originality of the double X overalls. 1890 was the year that the 501 number was first assigned to the famous pants, likely done because the company no longer had an exclusive patent, and also because it had a good sized line of clothing by this time. It was easier for retailers to order their products by number rather than a simple description, as had been done in the past. Any product made with the highest quality materials was given a lot number beginning with five. 501 for the overall, 506 for the jacket, etc. Made with double X nine ounce denim from the Amiskag Manufacturing Company, the 501 pant was at the head of the class. This is overall my favorite pair of jeans. I love the fit of the 66 and I think this is very similar. I enjoy the lighter denim and natural indigo blue. I love all the historic details. But most amazingly is how well this pair integrates into a modern wardrobe. They blend into any era. I should warn you that the cinch can cut up the furniture and other clothing. The 1890s have the sturdiest cinch of any pair. I use mine and I bend it back and forth and it stayed strong. None of the other cinches can hold up to more than one bending. There's a lot of other details that show off Levi's history while still making a functional pair of jeans. Of all the pairs of historic 501s that LVC has recreated, I am most thankful for these. The 1873 are cool and important, but historically accurate ones aren't functional for wearing. The 1890 jeans are something that was made so well back 130 years ago that they could be seamlessly integrated into today's wardrobes. It's the first 501, the number that has become a name. Thanks to my Patreon members, you guys rock! You can help out the channel by subscribing, liking, leaving a comment. Thanks to my subscribers for getting me here. I'm Den. Thanks for watching Den and Denim. Love your jeans.